Uh, uh, and I'm going to serve as the moderator. That means I'm introducing everybody, and I'm going to get out of the way, I think, because uh, uh, this is the time for the whole crew of us to get together and talk here. Um, I'll um, introduce the, thank you, Olin, for, for amazing to set all this up, all the energy that Olin's put in it has been, I've been getting a fraction of the emails, and it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody briefly, and then um, in the order that I introduce them, um, you can either sit at the table and talk for your five minutes or so, or come up here and stand here and talk at the podium. It's totally up to you. Okay, everybody? Um, thanks, everybody, for being here and for staying for this, uh, for this uh, bit of the, the, the program that Olin's organized for us. JC Foley is sitting at the far end of the table. Hey, JC. JC is a Ball State alumna earning undergraduate and graduate degrees in education with emphasis on curriculum development and educational leadership. During her public housing focused career, she has developed and implemented innovative education programs that helped disadvantaged families, guided scores of Hope Six residents towards self sufficiency and dedicated her life to educating youths and adults in non-traditional ways and settings. Currently, JC is the managing director of the Huffer Child Care Resource and Referral, an agency that promotes quality child care by providing support services for families, providers, and the community. In this role, Ms. Foley oversees services provided in 11 Indiana counties. Prior to working at Huffer, she was the director of community and supportive services for the Muncie Housing Authority. JC resides in Muncie with her husband, George Jr., and their teenage sons, George III and Carrie. Uh, JC, thanks uh, for joining us and coming back to Ball State today. <laughs> Sitting to, uh, next to JC is Jeffrey Hager. Jeff, uh, welcome here today. Uh, Jeffrey was born and raised 40 miles south of Muncie in Knightstown, Indiana. During two decades of work for Central State Hospital, he witnessed the slow demise of institutionalization and closure of state-supported mental health care facilities. Starting in 1994, following the shuttering of Central State's Indian Indianapolis facility, Mr. Hager worked for two years with mental health institutions in a private capacity. Jeff is an entrepreneur, absolutely, and founded several businesses, including Respirator Maintenance Services Incorporated, and Staybright Incorporated. He also owned for six, six years the Whitewater Valley Speedway near Liberty, Indiana. Times are tough, we all know that. In recent years, Jeff closed those businesses, went through a divorce, and found himself residing in shelters and at times homeless. He now lives in Muncie, is committed to self-sufficiency through self-determination and institutional support, and works as an activist as witnessed by his participation in this panel, combating poverty in post-industrial severely distressed communities like Muncie. Thank you again, Jeff, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, next to Jeff is uh, Emery Davis. Uh, em uh, early in his life, Emery Davis Jr. lived almost across the street from Pruitt Igo in the Carr Square Village public housing development. I shout out to Emery, welcome to the architecture building. Finally, as he wanted to go into architecture while in high school, but found little opportunity for blacks in the field. Mr. Davis was awarded a BA from the University of Missouri St. Louis and attended the Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. In 2001, he retired from a career's work at GTE Verizon. Well, in the corporate world, he was active with the Urban League's Black Executive Exchange Program. He also developed the Minority Intern Program for GTE. And Pastor Davis, as he is called, is registered with the Speaker's Bureau of the Civil Rights Movement Veterans. Oftentimes, his energies include students at historically black colleges and universities. He is married to Laureen Ellison Davis with a blended family of four adult children. Thanks again, Emery, for joining us today, and welcome to architecture. Thanks. Thanks. Patricia Whitberg received her PhD in urban sociology from the University of Chicago in 1982. She's a professor of sociology at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Her research centers on faith-based organizations. Her most recent book is titled From Piety to Professionalism and Back. She is currently participating in the Faith and Organizations Research Project, originally funded by the Lilly Endowment. 
Dr. Patricia Whitberg is a member of the Association for Research on Nonprofit Organizations and Voluntary Action, the Religious Research Association, the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion, and the Urban Formal Organizations and Religion Sections of the American Sociological Association. She has edited the Review of Religious Research, served on the governing boards of committees or or of organizations dedicated to the study of religion, and lectured at meetings and conferences in North America, China, and Australia. Sister Patricia Whitberg has taken the call to life commitment as a sister of Charity of Cincinnati, an active Catholic community of women. Thank you, Patricia, for joining us today. <laughs> Leonard Harris is a professor of philosophy at Purdue University, where he is a graduate faculty member of the Philosophy, English, Communications, and American Studies departments. He is also a former director of the Philosophy and Literature PhD program and the African American Studies program. His many honors include Fulbright Scholar, Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, visiting scholar, King's College, Cambridge, England, and non-resident fellow, W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for Afro-American Research at Harvard University. Among Professor Harris's significant contributions are numerous writings on Elaine Locke, an American philosopher and educator, and the first Amer African-American Rhodes Scholar, best known for his writings on and about the Harlem Renaissance. Locke's legacy lives today through the Elaine Locke Charter School and Family Literacy Center on Chicago's West Side and the Elaine L. Locke Elementary School in Gary, Indiana, among many other schools that bear his name. Leonard Drove is driving four hours today to talk to us for five minutes. I'm going to ask Olin if we can give um, uh, 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 Leonard maybe six minutes to make his presentation today because of that. <laughs> Thank you, Leonard, for, for joining us today. Uh, JC, how about it? Yeah, please. Good afternoon. Um, I feel very privileged to be a part of this gathering today and to have the opportunity to speak with you about my experiences with um, public housing. Um, I was born in Indiana, um, lived in a middle to upper class neighborhood. And however, I did have opportunities to interact with folks who did not have as much as I had. And um, in coming to the Housing Authority to work, my, my role was to help rebuild the people who lived in what was then called the low end. And the housing that was there was um, basically barracks. There was um, brick, mortar, and very little else that existed. There was crime. and other things. Um, so in, in my role, I worked with residents who were being moved out of public housing to most of them went actually to Section 8, which is a program that helps to pay a portion of their rent. During that time, um, I, I came to learn that everybody really wants basically the same things. The um, film mentioned that the folks who moved out of the city wanted, I think it was gardens, green grass, and air. And um, those were the things that the residents of the Muncie Housing Authority also wanted and had never had the opportunity or even thought, um, even the thought of being able to move out of, out of the area to something um, new and something that they could call their own. Um, I don't know where I'm at in time. Am I okay? Um, so it was a privilege to work with individuals. We provided training um, as well as um, help them to actually find places in neighborhoods throughout the city. A lot of what had gone on prior to the hopes, um, very early in Hope 6, which was the funding that provided us money to actually tear down the old places and build up new um, homes. Uh, was that many of the people were displaced. As you saw in the film, they were told they needed to leave and where they landed didn't really matter. And so as resident services director, I was able to um, find places, help them to find places that um, were good for their families and that had green grass and, and, and the gardens. And so 
What we found was that we did such a great job of helping them to find those places that when Millennium Place, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Millennium Place, which is if you ride through the center of town, it's on Madison Street, um, just beyond the McDonald's there on Madison. Um, many of them did not even want to come back. Um, they were very happy where they were. Um, and those that did come back, uh, came back to new surroundings and it seemed to help them to feel better about themselves, the places that they were able to raise their children, um, and it was a very good experience. My biggest concern at this point, and even in watching the film, is that the housing that was built is not owned by the housing authority yet. Um, it, there's, I think, a 15 year, 15 years um, after it was built, it will, return to the housing authority. And I'm so afraid that what we see happening, hap, what we saw happen in the film will happen with this housing. Um, there so far has been very little preparation where um, in anticipation of managing the new places. Um, and I can see how that might end up being the case down, down the line as it was for Pruitt. I go. I think we'll just have the presentations and then open it up for questions, if that's okay with everybody. Jeff, please. Thanks, uh, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. And I appreciate, Olin, you invite me uh, to this. Uh, it can be uh, very humbling at times to uh, talk about a person's life experience. So um, to be able to share I appreciate your time and the student's ability, may, may, mainly because I don't actually represent the stereotypical um, uh, person of, of poverty or uh, what you would see from a textbook or from a movie. Um, I started off with uh, running three different businesses uh, I presented uh, my businesses to uh, boards uh, of Chrysler, Eli Lilly, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when, I was, when I was actually running my businesses, uh, I, I made a very good uh, living at, at, at doing so. Uh, was not college educated. Uh, none of my family, um, we came a family of a single, of a single mom with six kids. Uh, we always lived in poverty. Um, and so I actually learned to, uh, at a very early age, uh, think for myself. Um, I could have went down the roads of what many other people uh, do drugs, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, had an opportunity back in the early uh, 90s um, to have a business of my own. Uh, actually accelerated at that, at that and then uh, started several other businesses. Uh, I had a company called Stay Bright that cleaned and replaced acoustical ceiling tile. I had uh, uh, contracts with the state of Indiana and Department of Defense. However, when the, uh, uh, the economy contracted, the first thing um, most businesses do is, okay, what are we doing, what are we outsourcing that we can do in-house? And unfortunately, all of my businesses were service related. So that was the first thing that went was the, uh, uh, my contracts and with ex within six months, uh, I was, went from making anywhere from 18 to $25,000 a month to zero. And um, to have that reality hit you, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what it is I done, could I done anything different and the answer was actually no. I was just in, um, caught up in 
the economy like everybody else and actually had a, uh, a heads up about three years before it happened because the automobile industry has indicators on what is actually going to happen. Those plants are now bulldozed. Not one of them are left standing. So uh, that's when I got into the racetrack business. That's when I got into uh, the business of cleaning and replacing acoustical ceiling tiles. A lot of people don't even know you can do that. That's why I got into it. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it was a very stark reality. I, I transitioned out of that, uh, went through a divorce. Um, all of my assets, anything I built up over 15, 20 years was uh, uh, split in half and sold off and anything you could think of in an auction setting that you see people go through that that was actually done and uh, found myself living in actually the, the Muncie Mission and then being asked to leave there uh, because I didn't have any money hmm. so um, I, I, it wasn't an issue with drugs wasn't an issue with alcohol. It was an issue that I didn't have money that they could unfortunately either uh, charge me for staying there or for services that was being rendered. Um, and I'm currently in, uh, uh, I reside in, in the, with the Muncie Housing Authority in one of their uh, public housing complexes. I volunteer at the um, the uh, computer lab that the Muncie Housing Authority has. Uh, I sit on the board of the Wayside Mission and I volunteer for a, another nonprofit called Take Five where they help people um, uh, obtain uh, hygiene products or things that you cannot buy with uh, food stamps and things of that nature. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to frame this because this is close. I'm going to get to my architectural degree. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my father was transferred to St. Louis Metropolitan Area in 1956 to a small church in Kirkwood, Missouri, a western suburb of the city. Much of my teenage and young adult life was spent in and around the St. Louis and East St. Louis area. In the early 60s, we lived in a public housing complex within a block and a half of Pruitt Igo Vaughn called Car Square Village affectionately called the village. So I kind of indirectly lived some of the history of pruitt Igel Vaughn. And you notice I'm referring to it as pruitt Igel Vaughn as opposed to just pruitt Igel. It's just what we did in the city. Because of this, my response to the film is understandably very subjective. And therefore, I would, when I first viewed the document, the pruitt Igel myth, I found myself, for lack of a better word, conflicted. I could have easily been one of those teenagers in the footage that we just saw in that house party dancing in the hallways with a pawn shop record player. That's about where I was in St. Louis at that time. The documentary expanded a historical understanding of Pruitt Igo Vaughn far beyond that which I had heard about living in St. Louis. And this new reality presented in the film also added to, to me becoming more conflicted. In 1956, I was not aware of class or who was poor in what black neighborhoods. First of all, being poor was not how black folks thought, how we thought of ourselves. The only thing which we were sure of is that we were black and most white folk did not like us or at least feign some toleration. The defining character was our blackness, not our class or our economic status. And I'm not sure even today that I think in terms of people in terms of their poorness. So what began to gnaw at me seeing the film was a broad scope of the social political background that was preeminent in decisions and determinations that led to the inception, the planning, and implementation of public housing in St. Louis, especially Pruitt Igo Vaughn. First, we as a people were determined to be poor folk living in slums and that the slums had to go. We were not told anything new. We knew we lived in the slums. 
We knew that it was hard getting by, but as we as a people, we had learned how to survive. The reality was that the reality was that that was the hand that was dealt us by white America. What we didn't know was that we were poor. We just didn't articulate that word. As I sit here now, I find it ironic that the book that I was reading in 1958, Something of Value by Robert Rauch, comes from a Basalt proverb that says, if a man does away with his traditional way of living and throws away his good customs, and I would add those things also with which he is familiar, he had better first make certain that he has something of value to replace them. Those in Pruitt Igle, as well as other public housing projects, were summed up, I think, by the words of Ruby Russell. When she called her apartment a poor man's penthouse, replete with furniture more than likely from Friedman Brothers ISI Brown Furniture Store downtown, articulated true words from those that lived there, especially in the early stages of Pruitt Igle Vaughn's existence. There is yet another iteration of conflict. It was initially understood that Pruitt Eigelvon was to be a place of affordable housing for folk who could not find decent housing in a segregated St. Louis. People that I knew and people that I knew of at an early point moved into Pruitt Eigel where all folk, where most all folk had good paying jobs and even in some cases, as was the case with my brother's girlfriend's family, two family incomes. It was an impossible dream. For a period of time, as was the truth in the case for Brewster Homes in Detroit, which Diana Roth lied about, in Pruitt Igo, you had to be somebody almost to land an apartment in Pruitt Igo Vaughn. That understanding was missing from the dark brush that was used to paint the documentary that also contributed to my being even more conflicted. But the dream was offered, and it was a nightmare from the beginning and had not yet come to be. One cinematographic note as I close. It's interesting to note that the wide-angle shots of Pruitt I. Govan, in most cases in the background, were three distinct features of the St. Louis landscape. St. Louis Gateway Arch, a supposed symbol of the future of St. Louis, St. Stanislaus Catholic Church with its twin spires, as any church symbolizes hope and peace, and the top of the civil courts building containing the federal court, the obvious and overwhelming presence of government and community. Thank you. I wasn't sure if we were going in, in straight down or in the order that you read it. So. Um, I, too, am very happy to be here and to have been invited. This is my first time being on the Ball State campus, and it's lovely. Um, the building is very lovely, too. I'm interested in, I don't think I'd ever want to be an architect, but I, I certainly do like looking at some of the better done architectural things. Um, also, as a sociologist, I really like this, um, uh, this film, and um, I'm intending on showing it in class, I must say, uh, primarily because it focuses on the, the large-scale historical and social forces that, that, um, that both uh, Reverend Davis you know, and, and has had, talked about, you know, that loaded the dice, I suppose you would say. Um, instead of the mainstream media, the, 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 the myth, that um, the fundamental myth of the time, which was that, well, those people just don't know how to take care of their houses. And so it's all those people's fault. And we don't want those people moving out to Ann Hill or, or wherever those other places uh, were because they don't know how to live and they wouldn't appreciate our nice suburban houses. Um, in actuality, um, there are large scale forces that, um, that impact on the, 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 the conditions that we live in, the choices that we make. Um, and we, like Jeff, go around saying, you know, my God, what did I do wrong when it's not anything that we did wrong? Um, there are large-scale economic forces like market failure. Um, it's simply a fact that no matter what some of the current uh, people um, talking about becoming president uh, might tell you, 
it's simply a fact that, you know, um, the cheapest house that the, um, the free market could provide is way beyond what the poorest people in our society can afford. You have three choices then when that happens. You can degrade the housing stock, and we saw pictures of what you know, people lived in before the public housing was built, which means you'll build it without frills like electricity and plumbing, because that's too expensive. Uh, you will crowd people in it, what was it, 12 children in one room and the mother's sleeping in the kitchen on a rollaway. Uh, Actually, maybe we, we'll, we'll crowd two families into that. And I, I, as Roland remembers, I have pictures I passed around in class of what some of the areas in Chicago look like. So you can allow the free market to work, and those, those people will live in that kind of condition because that's all that can be provided. Uh, or you'll give people housing vouchers. If you do that, unfortunately, all that happens is that the people that own the house uh, you, have more, you have more money competing for still a limited number of houses. It bids the price up. We've seen what happens when people bid prices up of housing in California and Nevada. Um, sooner or later, the, you know, it's, it's very bad. Or the government can build the houses, um, which, is, which runs smack into the second myth that Americans have. The first one being, you know, it's those, it's, we have individual choices that you make, and you make those individual choices, and it's your fault, which, which uh, Republican candidates said if those people are poor, it's all their fault. Uh, in any case, the second one is that whenever the government does something, um, it does it badly. We don't want the government involved in our, and then you know, insert the name of the program you don't want the government involved in. Uh, in actuality, the government is involved all the time. It was the government that built the expressways that funneled those people to the suburbs. It was the government, and, and, and very successful expressways they are, too. Thank you very much. Um, at least they, we, well, we're, the government's less good at repairing them and updating them. So every now and then a bridge falls into the Ohio River. But normally, but at least in building them, uh, the government was involved in the uh, federal housing, the, in the housing um, uh, laws of the late 40s that that subsidized the building of housing in the suburbs for white people. African Americans were not allowed to apply for them, almost done. And um, you know, the government was involved in, as um, Arnold Hirsch says, recreating the second ghetto. You know, once they built the houses, you know, the, you know, the government is very efficient at stuff the government wants to do. And what the government, by and large, wants to do is what some very it, all too often, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a cynic and say a blanket thing. I'm never cynical. Right? Yeah. Uh, but what all too often the government wants to do is what um, large-scale economic interests in the city, in the, t the state, in the country um, are influencing the government to do. They simply have more money than the rest of us to do that kind of influencing. Um, another aspect that um, the, the people who promote the myth that it's all their fault is the assumption that only they are the irrational ones. Don't they know that if they just, if they're, that by, they're not paying their rent, so they're going to, you know, isn't that irrational? You know? um, when in actuality we're all irrational um, about something. Um, you have people, um, you have the not in my backyard syndrome, um, where I used to teach and work in the South Bronx, and um, there were um, neighborhoods in New York, um, actually not the South Bronx, which is pretty blown out, but in Queens, where they, they, had a, they, had a sh they were having a shelter for babies because the crack epidemic was the first drug that broke the mother-child bo mother bond. And women that were unstrung out on crack in the 80s would deliver a baby in the hospital and walk away. And these babies were piling up in the hospital and the mothers could not be found. They had, they were, so they wanted to have a, a shelter for babies in Queens. And the neighbors protested. We don't want these babies here. They're going to bring down our houses. These are six week old children. You know, so it's not, and, and the, the current thing in economics right now is something called psychological economics. Um, those of us that are in, in, in the social sciences sneer every now and then at these rational economists that say everybody behaves logically. Um, you know, Alan Greenspan was shocked, shocked that the market would crash like it did. 
Um, so there, there are these large scale social forces that are out there and if we just assume that you know, it's those people's fault that they're poor, they made all the wrong choices and that it's, it's a choice that you make, we're missing, a, it's a myth, we're missing a whole hunk of stuff. And I'm sorry that I, I Olin should have warned you, I always take longer than five minutes. Sorry, Mother. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Olin, for inviting us, uh, inviting me. Uh, Olin always comes up with these films which are emotionally trying and existentially destructive. I don't know if I want to continue our friendship. <laughs> um, and thanks for everyone on the panel. I've learned a great deal already. Uh, I sort of want to start off by condemning the architects and the planners and the people who made money off of the projects. Um, and, uh, and then I want to sort of raise a problem. The problem is, like you were pointing out, we use moral terms to condemn the people who are in them. Uh, we, may, we, we say they are at fault. Um, they're responsible for not raising their children. Um, they're lazy, they're untrustworthy. These are morally personal terms. Um, we use them to describe individuals. But when it comes to institutions, or professions like architecture or policies like the welfare policies, we depersonalize. There's the terms we condemn, we, we use are, you know, there's a, a public policy which is inappropriate. The welfare policy is inappropriate. Um, the architects are depersonalized. The planners are no longer there. They become rules and regulations. Um, and so, you know, well, so I'm suggesting that maybe I want to use moral terms to condemn those institutions which would be otherwise seen as depersonalized forces. So that's sort of a problem because we use these moral terms in this personal way. But also, I think it's valuable to look at how these institutions and are, are not blind, ignorant forces, but are morally culpable and responsible for some of this misery, for some of this inhuman bondage, this David Davis, this book called Inhuman Bondage. And that's what the picture reminded me of, is, um, uh, the inhuman bondage of slavery where people's relationship to their families are destroyed. That's characteristic of what it is to be a person, to care about your children, to be concerned about their ascendancy, to love your husband or wife. That's part of what it is we describe as what, what is normal personal feelings. When that's destroyed, we then see them as inhuman. We utilize these terms of condemnation. That's what the movie reminded me of, the way in which they created inhuman bondage and control of a population and then blamed them from their own situation. Um, and when work disappears, William Julius Wilson's, we know that people get parasitic, they hurt one another, and do harm to one another as a condition of creating their own senses of self-worth, which destroys their own possibilities. That's what the film reminded me of. It also reminded me that you know, we're living in sort of a, uh, 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 we're living on a planet of slums. Uh, Mike Davis's book, you know, the planet is full of slums, whether it's Rio de Janeiro, whether it's uh, Amacoco Road in, in Lagos, Nigeria, whether it's Jakarta, whether it's Johannesburg in South Africa. You know, we're living on a planet that everywhere you look, there are slums. And those slums are harmful. Some of them have long histories, some of them have short histories but they're places where people engage in harm to themselves, but the people who create these slums are anonymous. We don't see them. They're blind forces. I'm suggesting that maybe they're not so blind at all. Um, it also reminded me of another of the books called uh, George Yancey, you know, Black Bodies in a White Gaze. All of a sudden you have a, a community where white people can gaze upon black people as a spectacle. This becomes a way of which to, to look at entertainment. One way to think about this is if you turn on your television, you look at the cops program, watch people harm other people and find that as entertaining. Uh, watch people being incarcerated, people who are inebriated get pushed around. This becomes an evening of entertainment, something to look forward to watching, harm and misery of others. 
because then because it reminded me that the white gaze looks at the black population in his in his in his in his, in his community as if it were a spectacle, something to be viewed from the outside, a form of entertainment, a way of looking at those other kinds of beings. Those bodies then become obvious. Those bodies become representative of a kind. And when you're representative of a kind, that's hard to escape. It's hard to escape the discrimination that women face because no matter what you do, you become representative of a kind. You become seen as inferior. You can't escape that when you're seen as that. You become entrapped in that own, you become entrapped in this gaze and the spectacle. So, you know, that reminded me, it reminded me of this, this kind of existential angst that, 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 that's a part of moral condemnation. So for me, the part of the, 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 the film suggests um, to be cognizant of the, the kind of moral terms we use to talk about people and to be at least a bit more courageous in our condemnation of those blind forces. So we're not entrapped in a plan of illusion. Plan of, we're not entrapped simply on a plan of slums, that's for certain, but we are not entrapped in this uh, uh, empire of illusion um, where we never break out of the illusion that um, we're, we're agents um, and we're responsible too. Um, uh, and or that the, the forces that are condemning, creating these situations are simply blind and have no moral responsibility. So um, that's what I thought about Aiga. Olin's got a mic to hand around uh, and uh, we'll open the floor up. Right, Olin, is that right? Yeah, we'll open, he'll run around, he'll be happy to do that and we're gonna open the floor up to your own interpretations, questions, responses to what the panelists have just talked about. Maybe start with Steve and then back here. Steve Kemp. Is that Taylor back in there? Another St. Louis Oh no, Mahesh, okay. Thank yeah. you, Owen. Uh, I, I did my graduate studies at Wash U in St. Louis and was there just after Prude Igo came down. And one of my colleagues, one of my student uh, classmates, Mary Camario, who's now at Berkeley, wrote very persuasively about the, the illnesses that, that caused that project to succumb. But now, many decades later, do we know what kind of public policies at any level of the commons, the local level, the state level, the federal level, is, is good? What, what should the commons be doing about these, these illnesses in our society that that lead to poverty, that lead to bad planning, that that lead to the the tragedy of the that we saw so clearly in the Pruitt Igo experience. What should we be doing now? I can answer that. Engage the clients. I mean, if they want good paying jobs, et cetera, et cetera, find out what it is they need. A lot of these decisions were made without engaging them. They live in it. Who better to know how to fix it than the clients themselves? That, I was just thinking, uh, I don't know how many of you are architecture students, but um, um, there have been any one of a number of, of works uh, such as um, well, there's Lee Rainwater's Fear and the House's Haven, which was written about uh, Pruitt Igo. Um, but there's also Oscar Newman's uh, Defensible Space. Um, now, there's a lot, lot wrong with Oscar Newman. I'm not saying he's the only, um, uh, but nevertheless, um, there's some, as some aspects would be of, um, first of all, to ask the people that you're building housing for, what kind of housing do you want? A major, uh, when I was in, in grad school and I was on the north side of Chicago and I would take the bus to, and I walked past this really odd building every day. And it was some sort, it was housing for the elderly, it was one floor. And from the street, it was a long, low, one-story blank wall, no windows, and ever, punctuated by doors. And each door was to an apartment and there was a, a small, concrete thing about the size of this table. A yeah, with, with no, 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 no anything, just it was, it was a step. And 
you would see elderly black people trying to balance two folding chairs on that, and it was not large enough. Uh, one day I got a chance to go in them. They were designed by the famous architect I. M. Pei. Uh, and inside, they were beautiful. They were also sort of, the, the, f the face to the street was blank, but they were, it was like, a, if you could imagine an E or something, that the, 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 the long arm, the, the vertical arm of the E would be facing the street. And there would be, it was built around little courtyards where the arms of the E would be. And they were beautiful. But I am Pei, I believe is Japanese, and he's Asian anyway. And um, he wanted to build homes for the elderly where they could sit in a Zen garden and meditate profoundly upon the frailty and fragility of life. And that's really beautiful if you're building them for Japanese elderly. If you're building them for African American elderly who want to sit in the front porch and watch the world go by. It's not, you know, so asking people, and similarly, Lee Rainwater says just briefly in the some of the, nobody asked the people in Pruitt Igo if they wanted to have every third floor be a communal gathering space where the, the washing machines would be. It turned out to be a place where the gangs hung out and the women were afraid to use them. Uh, in the, 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 the African Americans, the, the kitchen and sitting around the kitchen table was a place where the whole family got together. And Pruitt Igo Holmes had galley kitchens, which only one, one person could fit in at a time. You know, so asking people, yes, both in the sense of what kind of a housing do you want, what kind of, what's going on in this neighborhood, what, in, you know, the problem is that asking people costs money, you're gonna have to pay somebody to do it, um, and it's not gonna be somebody that, you know, excuse me for being cynical again, um, it's, you know, the people that you will pay to do it will be people like Jeff, it won't be people that in the big architecture firms that are running the place or the big um, downtown business interests that want all those people all moved away from the loop in Chicago or, uh, yeah. The, the, the city of St. Louis um, made their decision obviously in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, all they knew was that they were looking at the future of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And in the process they had two problems which we have not even addressed and opened that worm yet, but it was uh, the soda car, which became Pruitt Eichel Vaughn, and also Mill Creek, which became Laclede Town, and they never asked anybody what was to go on. So when they made that decision, there was no input, just like Jeff said, there was no input. And, and so here it is, you move in, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, hi, I had a question. I uh, was just writing a paper on urban slums of India, um, and I had a question for Ms. Foley. I found that, like in my research, there were a lot of similarities. Um, that I found that whenever people migrate to like an urban slum or an open lot um, in hopes of building these self-built housing or self-built communities, that people move like or migrate in groups based on kinship, uh, like their caste or their religion. Um, and you said in your work that you helped like integrate people from housing projects like to communities throughout Muncie. Um, and uh, I was kind of watching the movie. I was a little uh, surprised because you watch you know the people come in to Pruitt Igo. They see it as a solution to problems that they've had, and then you watch as like their solution or the, like this dream idea like falls apart. But then they don't talk about where the people go afterwards. So, um, like, I don't know, that kind of makes me curious, but my question was, like, the citizens that you worked with specifically, like, once they're integrated into another neighborhood, like, within Muncie, do they feel like they have, like, the sense of community that they had back in the housing projects? Because, I mean, in all honesty, I think that uh, my personal opinion is, is that the United States is still, like, ur in an urban setting is very segregated, and I don't agree with that, but... Um, I do, I feel like that's what I see. Um, but like once they're out of the housing projects, are they welcomed by other people? Like are they welcomed by these communities that they're like newly integrated into? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to 
clear up the fact that I didn't realize we were commenting on the film. I had a lot of reaction to that. Um, but in terms of the folks that we moved out, most of them or many of them stayed in areas where their children went to school. So they still had that connection to community. Um, we found that um, there really is no watering hole in Muncie, and that's something that has been discussed in many different circles. There's no place to gather and be together um, in a way that um, brings value to their lives. We have um, Price Hall now, which is a center, um, a meeting space, as well as a computer lab. Um, we haven't, I, I do not recall there being much discussion about whether or not they felt welcome in those neighbor, neighborhoods that they were going to. However, with the project of Hope 6, one of the elements, the design elements, was that it was mixed financed and mixed income, which meant there were many different sources that went into building, building the space. What that did was it allowed um, integration of folks who were pay, paying market rate rent, Section 8, um, who were also in public housing, uh, as well as subsidized housing. And within that community, no one knows who that is. They're not supposed to know. Um, there's no specific home that's situated for you know, public housing. So being able to learn from one another was what we found was of great value. Um, those who, had made, who were paying market rate, realizing that the, the folks that they live next to or with, with, with were living in poverty but didn't necessarily have any different hopes or dreams or, or ways of doing things. And then those who were living in poverty, being able to learn from, from those who maybe had for years seen their parents or generations take care of the lawn and take out the trash and do all of those things that really help you to become a part of a community. And so um, that was one of the great designs. And you spoke about the porches. Um, another great element of, ho of Hope 6 was that each one of the homes had a porch. And what you find now is that um, folks go out and sit on their porch. There's, you know, it's a, it's a, a big thoroughfare, um, Madison is. And they talk to one another and um, have their own plants and, you know, yard furniture. And so um, it has been good for the neighborhood. Specific to St. Louis, as you know, when Pruitt Igo Vaughn was destroyed, those that lived there moved to the West End along Page Boulevard, Delmar Boulevard, the Bolivar. You're shaking your head like you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the, the Bolivar area, and and they took the same thing. Those were subsequently destroyed also because of the same thing that created the first slums before Pruitt was built, which you call, you know, the, the, the absentee landlords in that type of a situation where upkeep was not maintained, maintenance was not maintained. So that's what happened specific to St. Louis. And there's even more irony to it than that. And I'll share it with you if you're still around when I get through. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the panelists for really very interesting, deep, and uh, lived experiences of each of you and uh, the scholarly perspective as well onto the question. And as I was watching that, and I was first introduced to Pre Taigo about 30 years ago, 25 to 30 years ago, um, through Defensible Space, the book. <laughs> and. Uh, and over the years, and uh, particularly today, even now, I, I look at it and I say, I relate to it in a couple of different ways. Uh, first thing is the reality of, our realities of Pruitt Tigro, you know, and that was what we watched. And the second thing is, uh, Pruitt Tigro as a symbol or a lesson that we learn from and uh, be a little wiser in what we do in a variety of things we do, be it with uh, education. I know a few of you are in, uh, involved in education and uh, uh, in terms of education institutions. 
And the second thing is about uh, how to educate the architects. Because in architecture, we would love to make this a technical problem and uh, be able to solve that easy enough in a convenient manner uh, and never be able to talk about uh, the actual issues that underlie the cultural, the assumptions that are very deeply uh, embedded in cultures of peoples and, uh, and how to engage them. And those are all skills and frameworks and knowledge that are very essential to architects, landscape architects, and planners that are here in the room. So it is the latter question that I wanted to ask you, which is, as a symbol, as a lesson, what could we learn in terms of uh, a number of levels, public policy, or as a, a project, as a, a community project, and, uh, and in terms of what we do as educators, uh, what can we learn from these uh, examples? answer. For me, the village still exists. Car Square is a very viable community. Period in the statement. Figure it out. And is that what was destroyed? Uh, is a similar thing what was destroyed to make Pruitt Igo? No. No, okay. Just I curious. think they were built about the same time. Ah, but okay. the architecture is mm -hmm. low rise, right. two story, I think townhouse, um, community. Uh, but it's still there. It's a senior citizens project now, and, and there's two others, uh, three others in East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. They're still viable communities. It just, you can't stack folk 13 stories high. It just doesn't work. I'll be quiet. <laughs> that and not provide the funding that you need to maintain yeah. mm -hmm. that, that yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that would be one thing in terms of public policy and yeah. funding that could be addressed is um, making sure that when you build the community, you can sustain the community. And also making sure that a part of the team, the architectural team, is someone who's from that community who can also offer a perspective, um, as she mentioned, that is relevant to that community. I think maybe you could also say that architecture is necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, if you build something that's 13 stories high and you cram, you know, what did they, did they say 12,000 people? 12,000 12, people 12, in a complex, yeah. You know, in, in one in a place, you know, that's going to um, be very hard to, to rectify, you know, the architectural mis mistakes. But once, but even once you've built low rise and once you've, you know, there are the, there's more than that. You know, the architecture is necessary, but it's not sufficient. There's, there's more things that need to be done. The maintenance has to be provided for. Mm -hmm. uh, the ongoing engagement with the people who actually live there, you know, in the sense of giving them a voice in their community is the, the, the you know, the, the um, and there, there, there are other things that, like the, that that need to be done, this, the, the scattering across the city. Um, and we have tended not to, um, provide for those things. And then when the things fail, you know, then we say, well, you know, that's what happens when government gets involved. Um, my two St. Louis people, Cochrane. Cochrane existed until 2006 and was only torn down because it got old. But it was a smaller version of Pruitt Igle. I think there were maybe four or five buildings. But the tenants insisted that the rules of public housing had to be followed to the T, and it survived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even with its 11 stories tall, and its hundreds of people per building, and galley kitchens. But what, what, what you're saying at that point, they took, not control, but they had input mm -hmm. and investment. And they felt empowered, I empowered. would suppose. Yes. Um, yes, very the much same so. thing has happened here in Muncie with Whiteley the Whiteley community. Mm -hmm. Many don't know that the plan, actual planning committee had a document that specifically said this was an area where Negroes would be housed for the purpose of containing crime and Ooh, um, things of that nature. Wonderful. And um, what has happened is that's one of the safest neighborhoods we have in the city, largely because of individuals who came together to form resident council, uh, res very mm -hmm. strong resident council. Okay and who became engaged in their community. And so we talk about institutionalized um, racism. Even to this day, there are still realtors who steer 
folks into different directions based on their race or their economic standing. And mm -hmm. so um, being able to deal with those issues would be another thing. I would just like to ask, um, as I watched the film, um, what, what would be the rationale for the government um, telling an uh, able-bodied man to uh, leave, leave the family? And especially the uh, gentleman was saying that he was looking for a job. And he st he still uh, was you know was hiding. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't understand the rationale there. Um, well, it wasn't Ruby. It was the other uh, female resident uh, that that kind of responded to that in a way. It made no sense the rules that the public housing people put together. Uh, my father was working; he had a job. We lived in Car Square, but there were people across the street from us who were on welfare. They had a TV set. Okay. And it was understood, I was told when I came home from school uh, between semesters, Junior, if so-and-so and so over here knocks on the door and hands you a TV set, don't say anything, just put it in the closet. Hmm. That's how we got around certain issues. It wasn't that easy to hide the mail in a closet somewhere, as was alluded to in the film. But those were the rules. And, and I think as she said, we're going to give you the money, but we're going to control. That's the word. That's mm -hmm. the operative word. Mm -hmm. I think what, what, what uh, Leonard Harris was saying, too, is, is something. This, this moral idea, mm -hmm. you know, that by the mere fact, I mean, in the United States, by the mere fact that somebody is poor, <coughs> it is assumed that they are morally deficient in some mm -hmm. way. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't get the right education. You didn't um, whatever. And therefore, it's your fault that you're poor. And then so if you assume that the poor are morally deficient in some way, then you assume that they're going to be morally deficient in other ways. And they're going to be, you know, if you, you, know, you give those men uh, an inch, they'll take a mile, you know, and they'll just be, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's what Dr. Harris was saying is it's, it's, you know, the, the hypersensitivity to moral failings on the parts of the poor, and a much less sensitivity, if any, to moral failings on the part of the, the people behind the, the large scale social structures that made them poor. The, the longer version of the film, didn't mean to cut you off, speaks to that moral question about how people outside of Pruitt Eichel thought about the females, the single females that lived inside the projects. I think, too, it was a, a form of um, condescension um, to basically assume that we're giving you this money and how dare you have a man in the house who doesn't work um, and no account given to why he doesn't work or what he adds to that family structure. What's really profound to me are the social um, repercussions or implications of that happening in public housing um, <laughs> and how it has um, continued that cycle of men not being involved, especially black men not being involved in their families in the ways that they need to be oftentimes. Um, and it, it just it perpetuates itself. And it's, it's really sad that that's the case. And you still to this day, we sponsored a Father's Day initiative and invited fathers to come and be a part of their kids um, day out and have fun. And do you know that we had zero to come out? Um, and largely because I believe some of them didn't want to know, want others to know that they were living near their children or, you know, it, it had just been assumed that they were not welcome in that community, so. And I, I can add to that as, as a single dad of two small boys. Um, you were there, I forgot. Yes, I was there, <laughs> by the way, I was there. Because I also sit on the resident council for my particular complex, and what so has been uh, a wake-up call for me is the same things they were complaining about on um, 
the movie is the same things in our resident council meetings that they're telling the staff. Mm -hmm. The exact same, it's not different. So actually, we're, just, we're repeating history over and over again. We have an opportunity to change it, I believe, by engaging the people it directly affects. And the, the, the removal of the father from the house um, and the situation of control, we're not only going to control the card game, we're going to stack the deck against you. 80% of people that are incarcerated now came from single family homes without the father. They know this is the case. Over and over again, you'll see that you can pull up uh, Department of Justice statistics and prove that 80% of those come from that type of situation. So it, it's actually came to where th this wasn't an accident. This wasn't happenstance. It, I believe that at some point, one way, shape, or form is actually created to, to fail in some point. They just wanted to see how long it would take. I, uh, I just, I don't want to take up any time because I, I think this is a symposium that probably should be uh, more questions and concern asked for my younger generation. As I become 82 years old, I, I think in a lot of cases this country and this system of welfare has been perpetuated by different things like we just discussed men not being able to live in a house and bring up their kids. Everybody in those apartments that we just saw torn down were not there to live that way the rest of their lives. No. We don't have a count on how many of those families moved out and start developing on their own. I was, uh, I was born in Mississippi in the country on a 40-acre farm with, uh, with two other brothers. And uh, when uh, I left home, nobody told me that I was going to be able to go to college. If I, if I did, even after I graduated from college, they told me, you haven't been to college. You know, they still didn't believe it. So I'm, I'm just saying that a lot of self-determination is in, involved in, the, in people who live in these apartments because some of them want to get out and raise themselves and elevate their level and standards of living. So there's no count on how many of those families left there before uh, this, the place destroyed itself. Uh, so uh, as I hear you talking about this, I think also is that in a lot of cases, the welfare system is perpetuated by cases like what we just saw. Men can't live in the house and have raised their kids. There might have been more kids born, but at the same time, if this family is determined, they're going to get out of those apartments. And I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no statistics on that, is it? Not that I'm aware of. My mother always said that there's no college or university in the world that teaches common sense. <laughs> and I think common sense is also a big uh, should play, play a big part in some of the decisions that are made in these public housing systems and how we raise and allow families to develop themselves. There's a lot of self-determination out there that we don't even record. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I guess I want to Thank you. Um, that, and I guess I want to speak to two points. One is, um, Angela Davis is promoting what's called, you know, dem uh, 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 abolitionist democracy, but she's got a wonderful book on prison abolition. Um, and one of the things that we see is a tremendous uh, increase in the incarceration of, of black people, and particularly black males, um, increasingly more and more black females. And this is a business in which um, the black community is, is sort of a victim 
uh, perpetuation, uh, of crime perpetuation. It empowers the people on the one side who make money off of this and degrades and diminishes those on the other side. We also don't get to see them. They're not present. They're not a part of our community discourse. They're immiserated. One concept that may be helpful is the concept of the underclass. It has some issues, but in part of the notion is that you, what you do is perpetuate generation after generation of people who are unemployed, making them unemployable, but nonetheless you can use them for exploitation. Perpetuation of illegal drugs, promotion of the prison system. This empowers the people on the other side and disempowers the least well off. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so, so, so you know, the notion of men not being in the household, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, welfare policy promotes this. But on, on the other side, the people who are promoting it are gaining, while at the same time, the people who are suffering from it, we don't always see, we don't always get to, we, 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 don't, we don't take them to their, 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 their self determination or their, their moral capacities into account because we just simply condemn them. You know, you just blame them for any failing that they had. Um, the other thing is the, uh, I mean, I'm addressing two different radical issues, is that, you know, I, I, I like all the comments about what, you know, what architects and planners should do. I don't have any practical solution. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me bad things if they were a bit more imaginative. You know, if they stopped simply imagining um, solutions to fix something as if they were fixing it for now. You know, what does it look like three generations from now? You're going to have migration. You're going to have people leave. Some of this stuff is going to break down and fall down. It's going to die. What does it look like three generations now, from now, from hence, you know? Um, there's one of the you know. What, what, what's it going to look like three generations from now, four generations from now? And why imagine the future as a sort of duplication of the present? Um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm designing for men who are going to sit on porches, what does that look like three generations from now? What kind of porch is that going to be? I mean, I don't have the foggiest idea, but I think that if your imagination is, is a bit more forward thinking. I'm from Cleveland, um, and where I lived on 125th, uh, 125th Forest Grove, you know, it's just dilapidated, it's just destroyed at this juncture. You know, as if when they were planning those houses, they never thought that this was going to be old stock three generations from now. This is going to be dilapidated stuff. This plumbing is just not going to work. What's going to replace this three generations from now? I mean, so, I, mean I, I don't know, but I, I just think that, you know, if you have a little bit more radical imagination about possible futures that empower people, over time, um, that might, can't be harmful, I don't think. I don't know if it'll be helpful, but I don't, I don't see, I mean, you're not gonna be around here, but for so long. I mean, so what kind of planning are you doing that's totally conceptually designed for the here and now? Um, what about their children and grandchildren? You know they're not gonna live there, they're gonna move. What kind of planning are you doing on the assumption that they're going to live there over the next three generations and nobody's going to leave? What? What, what, what planning are you on? Uh, I, I just don't know. I mean, I just think that creativity is not a bad thing. I think taking into account the infrastructure also, one of the failings I, I think, and I think Olin would agree, is that with the Hope Six project, there were... Um, designs around having stores and places for people to, you know, eat and, and it didn't happen. So in terms of, of those folks who are there, kind of like the jobs being in other places, they have to go to other places to eat or have to eat from the places which are around, um, which aren't always nutritious, that don't provide a lot of for, um, variety, then those are things that affect the family. Um, a simple example would be a child having um, uh, fruit punch for, for their breakfast and that child goes to school and then all the repercussions of, of that happening. Just something as simple as, as good food, just healthy food can make all the difference in a family. So yeah. keeping those things in mind. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm from St. Louis, and that movie was really hard to watch. I was kind of tearing up. But um, I remember growing up, and there were all these divisions that I still see among the community. And I remember third grade finding out I didn't live in St. Louis. I'm like, what are you talking about? We're all, we're all St. Louis. And I was just wondering what you can say for this generation to undo that kind of idea of them and you know, what school did you go to and you know, what municipality are you from and just how to join together and see it as a bigger community, I guess. Well, that's a small yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it is. Um, the uh, quote millennials unquote the people born <coughs> since 1982, um, well between 82 and say 95 or thereabouts. There's another generation coming up after the millennials, but anyway, are the largest um, cohort that we've ever had, and also the most racially and ethnically diverse. And one thing that seems to have at least sort of taken uh, in their education, um, sometimes I wonder if grammar did, but that's another whole story. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but in any case, uh, that's just the result of spending Thanksgiving creating papers. Um, is, the, is, is the ideology that we, we taught them in school of saying that, you know, that, um, um, that it's not nice to be prejudiced against other people. Um, now, in it may still be the case, first of all, that you know, even though that the, that generation of people um, say, I personally would never say like that. Wife, I just wouldn't live next to them. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff is like fing maybe like fingernails on a blackboard. But you may still be blind to the to larger institutional uh, racism and classism that's out there. And I would think that the best thing to do is to um, educate oneself to become aware of it. You know, read some of the, the literature. Take a sociology book. No, seriously. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that they're, they're, it's, it's a hopeful thing that at least the individual level um, appears to be attenuating some. Um, but I think there's a lot of institutional racism still out there so that there is some work for you to do, I guess. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say, I mean, Ann Kurt has an interesting book called Analyzing Oppression. And part of her thesis is that oppression is a function of groups. And part of the problem with it is that you don't always see individuals. You see institutions that perpetuate racial oppression. Um, you know, and, and America still tenaciously holds on to the one drop rule. One drop of sub-Saharan African blood makes you black. Like so you, you right, so you've got, you know, you've got, yeah, blood of Jesus, all right. <laughs> You've got this bifurcation of race based on the illusion that there's this phenomenon called white people and black people. <laughs> and you're operating in a, third, in, in, a, in a new world where they did not have that illusion where black and white is defined by this one drop root of Sub-Saharan Africa. So you, go, you come from Egypt and you're jet black and you're legally white when you get to the United States. This makes no sense. George Bush goes to, 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 to Brazil and says, oh, you got Negroes too. And like, oh my God, where did you get the white boy? <laughs> you know, so, so America is confronted with its own insanity and stupidity by the way in which it defines race itself. Um, so in functioning within the international community, this becomes complicated. You constantly have to lie about what it is that you are and where you are. Um, so I'd say there is no magic solution. I don't think, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know one. Um, but to be constantly vigilant to institutional oppression, the way in which it is not always apparent, like she was saying. Sometimes it is not always clear how it works, but that it does work, um, especially within the context of a racially divided America. If you're a black man, you're a you know, golden cohort, or you're an athletic superhero, great politician, or you're a criminal. You know, you're deceased, you're, you're miserable, you're untrustworthy, you're, un, you're, un, you're unfatherly, you're never going to be a parent. And you get the last, the least hired, li least likely to be hired, least likely to be promoted, least likely to be seen as a worthy person as a black male in the same society that sees black men also as heroes. So it's not all that simple, this, you know, this racial divide, this racial insanity that is America's insanity. It's not necessarily the world's insanity. 
it's, you know, the stupidity of the way in which you define race here. Um, so I guess I would just, again, encourage vigilance over institutionalized racism, you, classism, you, and exploitation. You could, you could pull that even to a greater scope if you wanted to, mm. you know, by not just necessarily looking mm. at race and class alone. Um, we have, I think, in the American psyche, a need to categorize and quickly define um, individuals, institutions, groups of people, so we can deal with them within a half hour and three commercial breaks. <laughs> Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. A and if we can't do that, then that entity, individual, group, society becomes a problem. And then the next thing is, well, we got to build a solution for the problem. So let's build a Pruitt Igo. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, you see what I'm saying? Okay. And, and that's exactly what, 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 what Professor Harris says. But it's even bigger because it goes beyond race and class, I believe, in a lot of situations in the American psyche. Because there's so many images coming at us from so many different directions, especially the media, uh, whether it's newsprint, tele television, movies, whatever the situation is. Like all of a sudden now, some of us have got to figure out what we're going to do with vampires. <laughs> okay, I, excuse me. <laughs> there's a book by a guy named Jim Bishop called The Big Sort, yeah. S-O-R-T. And he talks about how we're sorting ourselves out on race, on class, on political ideology, and you know we're, we're <laughs> which is one of the problems of the Congress. I mean, you know, a generation ago, Tiff O'Neill and whoever the head of the Republic, they used to they used to play golf together. Now they won't talk to. I mean, now their 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 successors won't. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we categorize people like that. That'd be another thing to do is to create some times when people could find out that you know. They got the same ideas, the same goals and values, the same that aspirations and hopes as everybody else. It's like the mother who painted the black wall the black for her children, you, you know, willing to do anything. Um, just to kind of address your, your question, um, the thing that comes to mind for me is that as a student, sometimes you can become tunnel visioned and only deal within the realm of what you see immediately. As, as this generation comes up, I think they're going to have to, one, deal with other types of races. But I would, I would suggest that you make a concerted effort to get out into the community, to find out about other cultures, other social economic groups. Um, recognize your own propensity for racism um, and, and be able to acknowledge that and then in your own way address that. Um, and I'm not speaking of you specifically, but um, as people, we have to recognize that we have some preconceived ideas and notions that continue to separate us. And I think as the younger generation is coming up, they'll need to recognize that as well. And I would argue, as fourth world theory argues, that, that uh, because of our inability <coughs> to confront or deal with the social construction of race in any kind of meaningful manner, uh, it's really no use. We're wasting time talking about sustainability. We, should, we shouldn't even talk about it. Uh, it's just a joke. Well, um, I want to thank our, our panel, first of all. We also give them a hand again. And again, I hope you all enjoyed the uh, Prudigo myth and urban history. It'll be in the library in a couple hours so that I won't get a fine. So you can get it tonight, just get in line. Thank you again, thank you for staying.